Hello, Tom Lavecchia here with a very special edition of the Armchair Brie in collaboration with Mobsters Inc. We have somebody that I've been following for a while, um, uh, Anna, Anna, Anna Sergi. She wrote Chasing the Mafia. I'm going to put her link below. We'll talk a little bit about her, about her book, her upbringing, and she is arguably the uh, worldwide expert on Andragada and um, in my opinion, all things Italian outside of Italy in terms of she's in the UK. She is a uh, professor of criminology over at the prestigious University of Essex. Anna Sergi, welcome to the Armchair MBA and Mobster Zinc. How are you doing today? Hello, Tom. I'm doing very well, thank you. I'm still in Italy enjoying some little bit of sun today. Well, Bon, bon fer agosto. I'm glad you're enjoying yourself yes, yes, and yes. Uh, we'll, we'll jump right in so you can get back to your festivities. So my first yes. question to you is, and, and I kind of give a backdrop, what is Indragada supposed to be? We'll get to what it is in the second mm. question, but what is it supposed to be? Yes, so the Indragada is the Calabrian Mafia and it's supposed to be a criminal slash a lawful organization punished by the Italian criminal code as such. Uh, and it's also supposed to be originated in Calabria in after the unification of Italy, uh, meaning 1861 and obviously onwards. And today supposedly being the only mafia organization that is present in all continents of the world, um, supposedly the most, uh, the wealthiest, and the most powerful in the sense of criminal reach and ability to camouflage itself uh, are across all ranges of industries and sectors and economies. Correct. Now, as we know, <laughs> building your life's work on this, there is yeah. kind of the, the brush of what it's supposed to be. Um, in honored society, they deal, they deal in illegal activities, but there's yeah. supposed to be a level of honor society. One area that um, I kind of point out in Dragada, I think it has more of a religious kind of pagan type link mm -hmm. than others. And then that might be the strength. We'll talk in a second. But what is in Dragada in reality, especially from your standpoint? So it's difficult to say in reality when you're talking about a semi-secret society. So obviously there are some, you know, don't just take my word for it. But from my standpoint, what Endrangheta is, um, is surely an organization that uh, is built on a range of very traditional rituals and hopes and a, a made-believe uh, feeling of honor and uh, every, all the mafia uh, shenanigans essentially but at the same time it's also a very confused phenomena that is uh, turned into a brand um, and as as such attracted a number of outsiders into it which have no standing or no linkages with the traditional holds and the owner and everything else so the ndrangheta is a behavior a mafia type behavior meaning uh the people who are in this organization or around this organization tend to behave with arrogance and a feeling of impunity and uh, the usual uh, hubris and arrogance that characterizes mafia, mafiosi more generally with intimidation, extortion, and basically just trumping each other, well, everyone else's uh, rights. Yeah. And at the same time, this has created um, their involvement in certain industries, namely the drug trade, yeah. namely cocaine, has led them to manage, has led some individuals managing some pretty considerable chunks of money. Yeah. And when money is involved, obviously, this comes with a number of um, uh, of perks. Yeah. So if you are a smart mafioso, then you'll know how to invest it. If you aren't, then you'll do a, a mess. So the Ndrangheta today is a difficult phenomenon to read um, because it, it, it goes between this traditional idea that we have and the uh, setting, but also at the same time, it's evolving very, very fast. Okay. Now, what people, most people watching this respectfully, and, and even myself, I'll be the first to admit, and I'm learning a lot from Anna, her book and so forth. I interviewed Antonio Nicasso, who's a, a great okay. gentleman, um, but there's still a lot to learn. And what people really need to understand, and I want to drive this home is, one of the powerhouses is San Luca, as, as you know, and this is a, an inhabitants of 2,300 people. 
a lot of old people. It's not like it's not like Palermo or, or Milano yeah. or yeah. Torino. Like I, I have my opinion, but I want you to build it up. Yeah. How did the center of a 2300 town with a little piazza, nice people become mm-hmm. a global powerhouse? Because it wasn't just the drugs are the end game, right? But there has been a, a strong iteration. So tell us a little bit about how that came to be. Yeah, well, I think uh, it's it's an interesting thing to notice, first of all, that the Ndrangheta origins are rooted in rural places, Correct. dormant villages, where nothing ever happens apart yeah. from some mafia uh, yeah. events in Correct. the past. Yeah. So places like San Luca or any of the villages around San Luca, which are not naturally, not notoriously connected with the birth of the Ndrangheta Correct. are always mixed in uh, in between legend and mythology and yeah. then reality comes in yeah. so one way to explain this is uh, something I think I say also in the book if I'm not mistaken uh, is a bit like the relationship of um, uh, cat- Catholicism and Christianity yeah. to the Vaticans. Correct. The Vatican is a, is a square in the middle of Rome, yeah. and yeah. yet it holds such a power, such an evocative uh, power, and also real power when it comes to decision making. How comes that um, if you are a Christian, if you're a Catholic, you don't have to go to the Vatican Correct. in the same way as Andrangetista doesn't have to go to San Luca or even come from San Luca. It's Correct. just this sort of solar. Um, star, the solar system, uh, this star right there in the sky that kind of guides you. So that's what San Luca means. And San Luca is, as a village, as you are correct, it's a very small, unassuming place, kind of poor looking. People are terrified of each other most of the time yeah. and of foreigners. But at the same time, they are uh, plagued with a with the legendary mythology of the Ndrangheta for one reason specifically, which is the fact that they are the territory where the Madonna di Polsi sanctuary yes. is built. Now, the Madonna di Polsi sanctuary, uh, the Madonna della Montagna sanctuary, is a very peculiar phenomenon linked to the Ndrangheta. You introduced before the links with the spirituality and religion, and yes. this is very much it. So the legend says that in the territory of San Luca, meaning territory of Polsi, where the Madonna of the Mountain Sanctuary is, the 12 tables of the Ndrangheta were found, these 12, Uh, it it, kind of resonates as a religious, um, uh, you know, cult, um, cult, (laughs) yes, (laughs) was thinking. Uh, So in that sense, um, it kind of makes sense that this legend stuck into a place where eventually some of the families were among the first ones to um, think strategically about coming together for some specific reason. But the Ndrangetisti from San Luca, the ones that we actually remember, there are many of them, but the ones that we actually remember that made the history of the Ndrangheta were really the kind of, again, mythological figure of the the good man mafioso. Yeah, like almost a man man of valor, that's how they were. Yeah. Is a old style kind of uh, worker, people who wanted peace, people yeah. who also wanted, you know, things to be quiet. So right. we have this mythology all around. Now, it is according to the data that we have, it is still true that this, uh, the, the families around San Luca hold a place of, let's say, reputational leverage. So yeah. when, you, when you have a problem and you need something to be fixed, that's where you go. Correct. That's who can solve things. But in terms of actual criminal power, it's very disputable that they still hold the kind of criminal power if we assume that criminal power means money and it means rich. Correct. They surely are powerful and rich, but their uh, power lies mostly in the reputational uh, and historical Correct. value in the guardianship of the territory that they hold. Yeah. Well, I... Um... It kind of leading to how they built up. So, so I, I like to cover, and again, don't get me wrong, it's hard to yeah. strip away the the morality of this, but I do my best to try to look at this like you do. Like you look at it academically, I look at it from the business aspect, right? Yeah. So how did they grow? Okay, so I'll give you a, just a quick story. Um, we married into Calabrian family. I, I told you some of the surnames, you actually knew them. So this is a small world. And yeah. uh, they would not go to Italy as much or they wouldn't go to Italy. And I would say, you know, why don't you go? 
And like, well, at that time, and we're talking like the eighties as an American, they'll kidnap you. Um, so, 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 you know, that I, I maybe made an exaggeration, but they were yeah. really worried about kidnapping. So in my research on how they built their stage, there were so many kidnappings by Indragada that La Stampa, Corriere de la Sera, and the big, mag big magazines and, and, and newspapers would have sequester season and would actually oh. list, list almost as like, hey guys, here's the kidnappings this week. Tell us a little bit about how kidnapping brought these guys to a global superpower. Yeah, so first of all, because obviously I'm an academic, I need to clarify that what yeah. the perception and the narrative was wasn't yeah. necessarily the reality of it. Yeah. But I do understand that obviously the more you were away from a certain reality, the more certain narratives consolidated, and that Correct. is obviously the case. Yeah. So um, the period of the kidnapping is uh, extremely complicated by two things. First thing, uh, the lack of reliable data, and second thing, the fact that most of the kidnapping ended in a, a secret manner. Correct. We are talking here about over 200 kidnappings in the space of, uh, who's, who knows, some say 15 years, some say 10. Yeah. Some kidnappings might have been attributed to the Ndrangheta, but weren't. Some mm -hmm. others might have been carried out by the Ndrangheta, but they weren't counted. So who knows? So we are yeah. ranging between 20, 200 and 2050, which Correct. is a very big diversion. And obviously the fact that the first one is attributed to, well, the first kidnapping was the one of Paul Getty III, doesn't yeah. help the imagery of um, the American kidnapped. Yep. <laughs> um, around here so the kidnappings were a choice that were made that was made um the kidnapping industry was a choice that was made by a number of clans not all clans yeah. but the more visionary ones the ones that decided all of a sudden that they didn't want to be stuck into the local extortion rackets right. kind of like uh, scrambling for peanuts but they wanted to invest in drugs and investing in drugs require money now investing in drugs obviously requires connections some of these people had the right connections at the time with the Cosa Nostra and yeah. the, obviously they were serving already Cosa Nostra roots for heroin and cannabis right. so the idea was okay let's let's try and grow up a little bit and let's try and think ahead and uh, it wasn't um, the majority that wanted this uh, as I said the the Ndrangheta is every mafia is a traditional um, force, so Correct. they are a conservative force. But the newcomers, uh, which were namely the Plati original yes. clans, um, ventured into this. And they ventured into this with um, some sort of safety net. The safety net was that if we bring uh, random people um, into the Aspromonte Mountain where they were, our knowledge, their knowledge of the Aspromonte Mountain is such that basically no one will ever find them here because the Aspromonte is a very difficult place, geographically speaking, uh, is a beautiful, fantastic, amazing place Correct. precisely because it's very difficult to navigate. So bringing people to the Aspromonte meant uh, two things. A, difficult to find, Correct. meaning a little bit of leverage, um, leeway into how you handle it. But more importantly, we can involve our own families, our own uh, villages into Correct. the for kidnapping support. industry. For so it wasn't only a problem of where do you keep the kidnap victim, which could be a, a natural cave in the mountain, but how do we feed them? How do we um, give them blankets? How do we make sure that they, if they are sick, they don't die in here without us getting any money? Yep. So the whole issue was more than just kidnapping people. It was about an industry, as we said, right. uh, which involved a number of other external people, which either for denial or for um, oppression, uh, offer their support to the clans. So the kidnapping uh, season, as we call them, La Stagione dei de Rapimenti, is a season of accumulation of capital, is accumulation of wealth in the easiest way we can think of it. We need cash, we need untraceable cash. How do we get cash? Easy. So that was something that, by the way, it wasn't Ndrangheta's idea. Yeah. It was a period where others were committing kidnaps. Sicily, 
was yeah. among uh, the regions with the highest number of kidnappings, uh, more or less attributed to Cosa Nostra. Uh, Sardinia uh, had the so-called Anonymous Sequestri, the anonymous kidnappers, uh, which was another organization less uh, problematic than the Ndrangheta in, in certain ways, less organized, but still quite uh, violent in the way. So kidnappings at that time was a clear vulnerability of the Italian state where you know, it was difficult to trace money, to trace ransom, and obviously yeah. that had to change. But definitely accumulation of capital, definitely this brought uh, certain clans in onto the map way more than others. Yeah, so, um, and, and uh, in the interest of time, so, so to build the base, they, you know, did a whole bunch of kidnappings, as you said. I like how you say, you say kidnapping and visionary in the same sentence. Just for, yeah. us, for us normal people, that's crazy. But when you think it's yeah. like Zagada, it makes sense. So they basically took the money from, from the kidnapping. And interesting enough, in the in the Getty case, the yeah. amount that they aligned to was based off of how much he can give and still write off on his taxes. Not a lot of people know yeah. that. It's 130000 yeah. or whatever. They wanted 300000 they gave 130000 And he just wrote whatever he can max write off on his taxes, yeah. which I think is insane yeah. when it comes to your grandson. But that's another discussion. <laughs> now, now. Yeah gentlemen like Antonio Pele and others, right? Now they yeah. took this money and don't get me wrong, they still do hashish, they still do heroin. But one thing they did genius, and, and, I, and I, I don't like to use this word because drugs destroy lives. But one thing they did was genius was they doubled and tripled down in the cocaine market. And mm -hmm. as I understand from Roberto Serviano was because wealthier clients, they don't die, they come back, it's easy to transport. And it's something we can dominate because they found an opportunity where Cosa Nostra was big on like heroin and other stuff. They were having problems with the state. So they had the yeah. opportunity, the motive and the financing to jump in to dominate the worldwide Coke market. So talk a little bit about, and if I'm wrong, yeah. you tell me some, some, I'm probably not. No, 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 it's a, yeah. no, I, I don't have the habit of telling if someone is wrong, but I do disagree on Saviano's okay. on many things, he says, but that's a different uh, story. Uh, but I think um, he, has, he tends to assume too much intelligence on the side okay. of the mafia, which is really not the case. Uh, right. The reason why cocaine, one of the reasons why cocaine, and there might be many reasons, yeah. um, why cocaine was the chosen uh, golden ticket um, yeah. was also because of the period in which the money became available to them. Right, correct. That's uh, the Nrangheta in at the end of the eighties um, uh, was uh, handling well. If we they were rational human beings and some yeah. of them were, yeah. uh, was facing two different problems. One problem was that the state was going down heavily on mafias. Yes. So in 1989 we have the Maxi trial. Yes. Uh, 1991 the end of the Maxi trial in Sicily. Giovanni Falcone dies in 20, in 1992, yeah. leaving the, a heritage and a legacy of anti-mafia fight. So that wasn't an option. Yeah. Heroin was already a very investigated root of Correct. illegal trade. On the other side, uh, some of the Ndrangheta top mines, and there are not that many, as I said, but some of them are, were already thinking ahead of investing in the port of Gioia Tauro. They already had yes. invested in the port of Gioia Tauro, and the port of Gioia Tauro was built with an idea in mind, a legal idea in mind, mm -hmm. which was to boost uh, the Mediterranean links with Latin America. So obviously, if you, yeah, at that time, some of the brokers of the Ndrangheta, which were also brokers of Cosa Nostra in America, were already, uh, we're talking about Roberto Pannunzi, for example, these it. people were already diversifying into certain type of drugs. Correct. They were working for different groups. They had their own uh, links in Latin America. So it kind of went into, fit into place. The fact that cocaine became uh, that kind of, um, of chosen golden product. At the same time, what you say might also play a, a role because obviously uh, heroin in Italy, especially when I was growing up, which is yeah. uh, you know mid nineties, um, the opioids pandemic was uh, really something that we were bombarded on. Correct. It's the dirty drug, is not, no one likes it. Um, and it, see, it's, it kind of doesn't bring as much money as and for the many problems it creates. So obviously diversifying also to de differentiate themselves from Cosa Nostra made right. sense at the time. So I think it's a, it's a combination of different factors. And, and obviously, 
yeah, the amount of money also allowed them to enter the cocaine. But business. also, also, and I, I, you kind of touch on this and it goes without saying, it was the execution, okay? So now yeah. we kidnapped a whole bunch of people. We're sitting on cash. Cosa Nostra's having problems. Less than Roberto Panuzzi. To, it was interesting. They sent them to Colombia. Yeah. Right? They sent them to Colombia because they wanted to cut out, the, although he was a broker, they wanted yeah. to cut out the middleman. And I never understood this. The Contrera Caruana, did they partner yeah. with Indragada or were they mostly deal with Cosa Nostra, in your opinion? Uh, I think both. It depends how you look at Cosa Nostra at the time and what you would define Cosa Nostra. So the documents we have from Calabria at the time speak about certain Drangheta families, which were undoubtedly Drangheta families, like the Commission in Canada acting as a bridge family between the Sicilian Cosa Nostra producers slash uh, importers and Cosa Nostra families in America, including um, Bonanno and, the Bonannos, the Rizzutos and all of those. Correct. So the commissos were actively being the drug traffickers. So they were the one who moved, um, who used the Calabrian ports like Crotone, for example, which is a very small port on the Bronx side yeah. of the Tyrrhenian um, land, but it was strategic because no one looked at it. And from Crotone, you could go to France and then from France into the north of Europe and then to America. So the commissos at the time, which again, they are from Siderno, they established themselves in Niagara and just about Niagara, they played a crucial role. Whether or not they were recognized as Nranget at that time, that who knows, because they were just, you know, um, in, in that kind of amalgamation of Italian American criminal. Yeah, they were kind of causing, they might have been inducted as Cosa Nostra. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, uh, it, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's very difficult to yeah. say because obviously we look at it. I look at it from my lenses of today, right, but at that right. time, the commissars weren't the commissars. So they, they were just part of the chain, but obviously that made them uh, indispensable for certain routes, which allowed them eventually when it came to acting alone, to be able to act alone, which is what they did and what they still do. So there is a reason why when we talk about Canada and the US, um, certain families are more important than others and the Siderno group is more important than others, not because they are stronger or better, but because they've been there at the time when it was necessary to forge links with whoever was already there running the business. So they, they stepped up essentially and they did the whole hierarchical, you know, yep. climb. Yep. So. Well, so you, you, you're teeing this up perfectly. Okay. We talked about how they built the base. We talked about how they uh, uh, got in, in the drugs, but then yep. they forge the right relationships, right? So whether we talk about mm -hmm. Canada, we talk about Australia, which they ruled, yep. ruled the market. Um, we talk about even parts of South America, coincidentally. Um, we talk about Europe, goes without saying, and even Eastern Europe. So now they become a worldwide powerhouse. So now they start to become what we call a super cartel, right? Now they deal directly. They're, they're sitting back and saying, okay, great. Panuzzi gets picked up. Maybe we deal with Colombia. Maybe we deal directly with Los Zetas or we deal with the Sinaloan. Uh, so they deal direct, getting better margin, right? And better mm -hmm. supply. They co they control Giotaro, which yeah. uh, is is a porous port as we know. And then you'd say, hey, Albanians, you guys distribute it. So now, in my opinion, there is now a super cartel formed. Mm -hmm. I would like for you to speak about that. And in Dragada, in my opinion, is ahead. Okay, so I don't like the word super cartel. That okay. is a journalistic term that I don't like, but you'll feel okay, free that's to fair, use it. That's fair. Um, and the reason why I don't like that uh, is also because I don't think of the Ndrangheta as a powerhouse in the sense of a unique entity. I can't okay. think of that because in my head, every single time I see the Ndrangheta, especially when it comes to business, so what I see are single clans who yeah. trade on their own reputation and in that sense, you are right in the reputational, in the brand name, which is the powerhouse. So the brand, the name is the is the powerhouse Got it. abroad. Got it. it. So that that is at least my my vision of it, the way I would approach it. Yeah. Even when you look when you look at the and I think actually talking about the so called control of the Port of Gioia Tauro helps us in identifying and grounding these claims a little bit farther. So Gioia Tauro is a place in an area where mafia families are strong and historically um, 
peculiar, let's say that. So in particular, the two, three mafia families that are active in the Gioia Tauro port area are the ones who we would say control the port, but their control of the port is not um, total. Yeah. Uh, a lot of things happen in the port without them knowing. What happens is that for whoever wants to act under the Ndrangheta name, they have to handle their relationship and pay a fee a transaction slash guarantee slash protection fee to these three families in particular, the, um, um, the Piromalli, the um, Pesce, and the Bellocco families. Right. So these three families specifically are also, it, each of these family has its own peculiar interest in the port. The Piromalli family historically was the one that was extorting um, the port authority uh, the port business essentially yeah. uh, to pay 1.25 dollars per container in the mid 90s uh, for protection rackets um, another family was the one interested in the workforce of the port and they were running the workforce of the port the way they saw fit so there, there were kind of dividing up their interest one being more entrepreneurial the other being more violent depending right. on how you go now for all everyone else even today that wants to use the port of joya tauro to bring cocaine you can do it without talking to them i mean if they discover you it's a different story but technically speaking you can bring cocaine in your own wonderful container without them knowing yeah however there is no point in doing so because if you actually go through them you actively remove the risk of being discovered, you reduce the risk of being uh, found out by the police or the Guardia di Finanza or whoever, right. and more importantly, you act with their own network supply, which right. is stronger and safer. So the Ndrangheta brand um, works better when each clan recognizes each other's role. Right. So some clans have the cash, but they don't have the money, they don't have the name. Yeah. Some others have the name and have no intention in getting cash out. Right. So each other, they help each other in creating this, this sort of like uh, dome. Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, but I'm having fun with you. <laughs> it's up to you how you want to call it. To me, that super cartel means uh, something yeah. united and control. I, I oh, don't good see point, good point, good point. Got it. Okay. I see, I see many different heads yeah, yeah, uh, all the time negotiating shaping their role Correct. into and that's why sometimes you find it's very difficult when you see and i always say this to my students so i don't know how relevant it is for your audience but yeah. when you look when you read the ndrangheta invest in cocaine in venezuela yeah. the question is which ndrangheta which clans are we talking about right. because many clans are very different from one another yeah. some of them are made of very stupid people and they just emerged yesterday yeah. some other and they just have the brand name because they know someone and they can claim they are Nrangheta. some others have history history that goes back decades so you can expect something from them you can expect right. them to have a vision in the way they are doing business so it's it's not um it's not just an exercise in being pedantic is it's basically saying yes the Nrangheta is a brand yeah. but it's it's basically when you have to open a when you order something on Amazon and, and then eventually when it comes out and it's Amazon, then it's fine. But if you have to open a complaint, then you need to know whether it's Amazon, France, Canada, yeah. Italy, which one correct, is it? Correct, correct, and correct. each each country has its own rules. So the Ndrangheta is very much in that sense. It appears as a united front and a united collective name, but then inside it, as usual, men are very different from one another and therefore they create different structures. Yeah, no, <laughs> I love listening to you because of the fact that right. like your knowledge, your expertise, your passion. So, okay. So we kind of talk about the relationships, how they're intertwined, that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, collaboration, which is critical. I do want to talk about first Italy for a second. So we yeah, know yeah. kind of the, the Cosa Nostra, um, how they wanted to decline. You know, they took on the government. They went a little too far. But the Camorra, which has grown. But what I'm trying to say is there's three, four, maybe five organizations that are kind of sitting there. But and Dragada is head and shoulders above the rest. Yeah. Why? So we kind of, we, let's park Cosa Nostra side. I think we kind of know that lineage, right? Yeah. But but being an Italian, being a, a student of this, why do they also, Camorra could have did this. Uh, other organizations, I could have, could have, could have, could have did this. Other or, why why did they edge out the Camorista, mm -hmm. in your opinion? 
So the Camorra is another of those phenomena that is usually often thought as a singular and is not a singular phenomenon. Correct. You might have seen it in even in popular uh, representation. Yeah. One thing is to speak about the clans in Naples. Another thing is to speak about those in Mondragone. Correct. So the, the Camorra is always on the on the edge or in between Cosa Nostra and Drangheta, where some clans have the acumen and the vision of um, you know, going farther and getting into politics and getting into uh, local works and, and right. you know, exploiting the environment. Others are more interested in the masculine, toxic side of mafias, the violence, and yeah. kind of just, you know, using their muscles and exercising their muscle, and they clash. They never were a unified uh, organization. Uh, right. They cooperated, some clans cooperated with others on a need to know basis. Uh, every attempt to confederate the clans, even just in Naples, failed miserably with wars and feuds and all of that. So, for various reasons that have to do probably with the fact that it's a very extremely um, the, the history of Naples is extremely different from the rest of of the South. The um, Ndrangheta itself has, uh, unfortunately, um, as the history goes, been neglected for a long time. The mafia from Calabria was considered a second-hand kind of yeah. like second-rated compared to Cosa Nostra. Correct. The history of the Ndrangheta abroad was often sub subsumed, included in the one of Cosa Nostra without differentiating the two. Correct. But more importantly, the problem of the, of the Ndrangheta was that uh, the Italian state was concentrated on Cosa Nostra and thinking of mafias in a certain way. Mafia Correct. should be working this way. Correct. The Ndrangheta wasn't, so the fact that the Ndrangheta didn't have a boss, still doesn't have a boss, that the coordination structures are there as a, not as a top bottom um, kind of organization, but right. as a mu Horizontal, mutual yeah. recognition slash solving problem kind of issue. Correct. Um, never really fit into the Italian definition of mafia as a, um, you know, kind of a hierarchical commission. Da, 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 da. So even in that sense, the Italian state was building a structure around the concept of mafia, which the Drangheta defied. And then the Drangheta family, well, the Drangheta origins, differently from the one of the Camorra and, um, and uh, Cosa Nostra have, also have to do with the way Calabria is shaped. Yes. Calabria is made of um, constellation of small impossible to number villages yes. we are talking about villages of 2000 people 1000 people 3000 people so it's really really small while even the small let's say the smaller areas of sicily the castel vetrano castel lamare del golf these are still small towns yeah, we are talking about different. yeah right, right. so it's a very different um so the, the type of crystallization of culture and crystallization of behaviors that happens in certain villages the practices that go unnoticed are much much higher amplified for 300 villages yeah. each village had their own family which at times evolved into a clan some other times he didn't, some other times he got married with someone closer in the next village, but we are still talking about extremely fragmented realities that eventually formed a constellation of clans, a confederation of clans, which were and still remain incredibly autonomous in what they do. Whatever the Ndrangheta name means, they do remain completely autonomous. We're, and they can, because they're separated geographically. Which makes it harder. So, for example, if you're in a a town with a thousand inhabitants, you're yeah. not going to get an outsider to be an informant. Or yeah. so you approach somebody to be an informant, it's most likely a relative, which, which yeah. is we all know. Control, gonna, yeah. control of yeah. territory is much, much, much more um, visible and it's Correct. much easier to maintain uh, than a town with 40,000 people, where if, let's say, 1,000 speak out, speak up, then it's already a problem. In a, <laughs> it's really easy also to sedate any, uh, you know, anyone who wants to speak against. Uh, in a town of 2,000 people, if one person speaks against, it's easy to control. Correct. Correct. So, and also, you know, family linkages uh, in small towns and small, small villages are way more intricate than, yes. you know, bigger cities, of course. So I do have some few questions before we wrap sure. up of air of interest. 
Um, obviously, there are some operations in the U.S. There's probably some Adini here, but for the yeah. most part, I know you had, I know you talked with John Panisi. Um, for the most part, the Indragora kind of laid off the U.S. as a market and as an operational mm -hmm. structure. Now, Canada is different, but the U.S.A. Yeah. specifically. Do you agree with that statement? And if so, why? I think the U.S. is something that we need to study. And actually, yeah. I'm planning to study it in the next year or so, okay. as soon as I manage to get some money. <laughs> and because I think that has been a, an original sin in the way we studied the Drangheta in uh, the U.S., which is the usual sin yeah. of studying Cosa Nostra only, right. as, if, right. as if we knew everything about it, which is obviously right. wrong. So on, on the one end, we keep seeing um, re repeatedly um, individuals who are of Calabrian extraction in some of the, the families, uh, let's say New York, some of the, which is the reality I know a little bit better. So we do yeah. see some, some people who, whose grandfather was Calabrian, who is now within, in close proximity, let's say to the Gambinos or the Genovese. Correct. And these people are, um, they might not be in Rangetisti, they are maybe just of Calabrian extraction. They probably Correct. are. Cosa Nostra, but the difference with these people is that they have the right connection and, and if they were able and they wanted to activate certain links with Ndrangheta, they could way easily, way more easily than anyone else of Sicilian yeah. extraction could. Correct. Everyone has family in Calabria still. And th this is the power of migration. So in a way there is a potential to the Ndrangheta in the US, which in my opinion would be extremely stupid of some Ndrangheta family not to exploit. Now we also know that there are some new uh, investigations of a revamp interest of the Sicilians yes. from Sicily into some of the families in New York. Yep. And this, these links have never really faded, but now they, they are again into the spotlight of the Italian anti-mafia prosecutor. So within sure. that, again, uh, once you put all of this together and you shake up uh, what is New York, yeah. let's say at this stage, you have families who are struggling to maintain their identity because they have competition on all sides. Correct. The market is not what it used to be. If anyone wants to get into a new market, it would be extremely difficult to do. So they, it's better to consolidate the old markets, the old markets being right. public works, being political corruption, being Correct. you know some extortion slash basic um, racketeering. Yeah. Um, if they want to step up, the only way to step up is with Ndrangheta. There is no other way. Because Correct. even the families who are taking an interest in the Gambinos, again, well, they never lost their interest, but the ones in Sicily, yeah. the Incerillos and all of that, Correct. they are they don't have the kind of international reach. They don't. Correct. Correct. So, they could, so we could see an, uh, a third model here. So to in, in to simplify, in Calabria, the Ndrangheta detains the real substantial organizational power and the real substantial business power. Correct. In Canada, they hold the organizational power, but they have to make concessions on the business side of the story because they're not alone. They have to deal with the bikies. They have to deal with everyone else. Correct. In, um, in the US, we can see another thing even more, which is a, an extreme hybridization of the organizational power with a mix, with a brand name being Cosa Nostra, because that's the brand name and there's no doubt about it. Correct. That's the but brand it's name. all under that. Auspice. But with a, with a very hybrid formation at the, uh, yeah. inside, yeah. whatever the brand is, and a very hybrid, um, but Ndrangheta-led business power. So that would be my hypothesis. And this hypothesis is, you know, is because I keep seeing things, people going back and forth from the US, not living in the US, maybe living in Canada, people of, who, are, who have interest in the port of New York, who eventually are there for various reasons, Correct. legal reasons. So there are some elements that I think require further analysis, but until I can do this further analysis, you are stuck with my speculation. Love it. Well, when you come to New York, please let me know. We'd love to host you and uh, we'd help you in any way we can, Trust, especially with the good work that you're doing. Now, right. again, to bring up John Panisi, my former yeah. partner, you had a good discussion with him. Um, one yes. of the areas that is really fascinating to me as a podcast, right? I'm not nearly your level of criminologist, nor am I an official journalist. Okay. I'm a podcaster who has, uh, yeah. I guess, uh, I mean, curiosities, right? Um, yeah. And, you know, the 
We talked about Italy, but in the U.S., the Cosa Nostra here in the U.S. literally has become a shadow of itself, right? Yeah. And 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 part of it, uh, uh, and according to John and others, is that they stayed away from drugs. So ironically, and not let's be honest, not for moral mm-hmm. reasons, they're worried about longer yeah. jail sentences. The guys that were in power already sold drugs; they made their money. The younger mm-hmm. guys they didn't trust because they would turn. But in your opinion, in general. Should they, like why did the U.S. Cosa Nostra as a whole? I'm talking Americanized Cosa Nostra. Yeah, yeah. Why has that essentially failed? And we talked mm-hmm. about why Indragada had a almost a hockey stick incline. Why the U.S. Cosa Nostra failed? Why, in your opinion, is that? Uh, I think it's a matter of context meets opportunity. The context of when Cosa Nostra left, let's say, the business of drugs uh, in the U.S. A they were made to leave it because obviously law enforcement was really cracking down on certain things. And again, heroin was their maj- the okay. main um, sure. business and other came along. Yeah. I mean, there is no doubt. I mean, other better people yeah. came along and yeah. in a time and competition uh, is everything in terms of success in business, which is the reason why the Ndrangheta model and the Ndrangheta model is there to stay is because and we can see now it's happening again, but on a different level. Um, then the Drangheta managed to innovate the system, which Cosa right. Nostra didn't. Correct. Cosa Nostra wasn't able to innovate the, the, innovate the market. The Drangheta did innovate the market by, you said it before, uh, briefly uh, cutting out the middlemen and essentially creating a system where the investors, the importers Correct. are detached from the traffickers. Correct. So if you look at Europe now, and I have a fairly good impression that this is not just Europe, um, Western Balkan groups are doing the same. They learn Correct. from the Ndrangheta. They used to be the traffickers of the Ndrangheta in Europe, and now they are the importers, yeah. and they are using the same model. So if they don't innovate themselves, they are going to fail as soon as law enforcement cracks yeah. down on them. Yep. So, because eventually law enforcement is low, but they learn yeah. <laughs> one way or the other. Correct. So, unless you unless you mix it up and you innovate, then you're done. So, the, the Ndrangheta, I think, also has this uh, ability to, because they are they probably don't understand much of how the law works. Correct. They thought of America and of the U.S. and Canada as one thing. So oh they went no! One border. Absolutely yeah. not. Yeah, the Ndrangheta. I mean. Oh, correct. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Got it, yeah. Got it. yeah. So that's what I mean, which is yeah. they went up and down as if whatever. So they could easily, you could easily find that, that someone is importing cocaine into New York yeah. via New York port, but they live in Canada because it. that in the, in, it, it's difficult to comprehend. But correct. for some reason, that's, that's their business model because in New York, Cosa Nostra is active, so they wouldn't go there at the time. They wouldn't have yeah. gone there. So I think it's it's uh, in criminology we have this. Um, how do you adapt to a new market? You innovate or you kind of um, criminal market, obviously. You either innovate it or you somehow dominate it. If you can't dominate, you have to innovate. So the Ndrangheta now is at the moment where they dominated the they innovated, they dominated the cocaine and they are losing their domination of the cocaine trade, at least in Europe they are. Uh, so we have to see what happens next because that's, uh, you know, we we'll see what happens next. Well, so, so judging by or filtering by what you're saying is they'll either might have to activate a little bit in the US or yeah. maybe try to go to, maybe, maybe, maybe there's such big suppliers that they go to the source and say, listen, stop selling to them, or they got a yeah, you know, whole I mean, bunch of things that they can do. You know what I mean? They can do a different different type of things. They can yeah. enter, as they did in Australia, actually. One of the things that is often forgotten in Australia, the Ndrangheta has stopped, uh, not stopped, but has reduced cocaine. Yeah. Uh, and they, they are active in a different market, which they're not active in any other country, which is methamphetamines. Yeah. The, the Ndrangheta doesn't do methamphetamines or amphetamines right. in in Europe, they yeah. why would they? Yeah. But in Australia, that's the market that gives them money, and they do that. So eventually, they are also able to diversify. So that shows the, the maturity of the organization. So we'll have to see. But definitely, at the moment, it's interesting to see the partnership with the Western Balkans, the way it's changing, um, you know, the reputational costs of certain yeah. things. So we'll see. Well, one thing that's used to, uh, unique to Calabrians. So me, okay, so we're from essentially Napoli, but but. Yeah. Put up in Chavalino. 
So you'll find people from my mother's town. You'll find us in Canada, U.S., yeah. Venezuela, a little bit of Uruguay, right? But yeah. I've we married into Calabrian families, yeah, our yeah. family, and relatives in the and I, I, you ask any Calabrian, they know somebody from uh, yeah. um, Argentina. Yeah. They know somebody from Australia. My friend's wife has family yeah. in Australia. Um, they have family in South America, depending where it is. Uh, yeah. Canada, U.S. obviously. Yeah. So Belgium, Netherlands. Belgium, exactly. So, so did this diaspora, if you will, mm -hmm. of Calabrians going to maybe a little bit more reaching areas, did that help? Because uh, respectfully, Sicilians, it's New York <laughs> or New York, yeah. right? You know what I mean? Or maybe Canada a little bit. But my point being is, um, I'll probably get crap for that, but it's okay. Uh, but mm -hmm. nevertheless, do you think this diaspora or this uh, immigration to those areas also helped in Dragada kind of plant those roots in those areas? I think immigration was exploited. So it, there is no deterministic link between migration and crime, by all means. Um, but the existence of such a large diaspora and such a large migration community helped in the sense that it, they had more to exploit. So eventually, not all diaspora is exploited for the same reason. Correct. Some of the things I find the very interesting and difficult to explain um, is the Ndrangetista who wants to flee from Australia, who has family in Canada and goes to this family in Canada for a visit. They, it doesn't ask them to do anything illegal. They don't do anything illegal. Nothing does anything illegal, but the protection network that they can give they have, yeah, all around yeah. the world, that's what's helped. Mm. including the fact that in some cases the family doesn't want to know sometimes they want to know they know but they pretend they don't know Correct. so it's a, it's a whole mix obviously of family issues which you know every family is different in that yeah. sense but there is this this tendency of exploiting migration links in ways in which only family would and this in calabrian uh and i have you know I see this as a calabrian myself so you i tend to have to receive requests from people I don't know who are relatives of my relatives of my relatives in Calabria who are coming to London and ask me for suggestions and things to do and help and I don't know them who the hell are you so if I were a traditional Calabrian Correct. maybe would. I would help them I would feel I wouldn't say obliged but yeah. kind of like like yeah. okay sure you are the cousin of my cousin correct, correct, I'll help correct. you come to come to my house I have a spare correct, room correct correct so it creates, it kind of shrinks the world's possibilities into yeah. a one accessible ball. Yeah. And that's, I think, the reality, the, re, the reality of it, the exploitation of, of links. Uh, and obviously, the broader the diaspora, the broader the links. So, yeah, I have a few more questions before we wrap up. One is yeah. that, so, so this is where, and this is what makes it interesting as a life study, it's yeah. complicated in Dragana, yeah. the structure. Right. First of all, I, I want to put it the organizational chart because it'll give you a headache. Right. But but my understanding, though, it's not multinational. It's global, meaning with the exception of maybe Canada, because that's what Antonio Nicasa was suggesting. Yeah. He didn't confirm. But other than maybe Canada, each of the clans that are abroad all report back into Calabria, essentially. Is, it, is that true? Yeah. So what we found uh, in a recent study we did, I conducted in Europe, okay. um, which strangely is the least studied one when it comes to uh, the Ndrangheta, is that there is a, the Ndrangheta structure allows for the most extreme of flexibility models in terms of business, which is the um, uh, direct recognition of the power source. Meaning okay. if I am the clan um, let's say Piro Manli, and I am active in Gioia Tauro. And in Gioia Tauro, I, my family holds a certain status. I am the head. So the head of my family is the head of the locale. Yeah. And they meet with the other heads of the locale. They meet in the società. They meet in the mandamento. They meet in all the different structures we Correct. know they exist. However, so that's for the real power, organizational power in Calab. But when I go... If I, I, one of my businesses is real story to uh, invest in oil uh, and export Calabrian extra virgin olive oil into the United States and France, um, I have 
I don't have to tell anyone what I'm doing. First of all, I don't have to ask for anyone's permission. And what I can do is to send my, to use some of my family members who live in France or who live in the US to operate in this, to help me out in this business. So maybe I have someone who is a, who is a truck driver in France and he can help me with the paperwork and all of that. And I will do that. So if that person in France sets up a small clan, because maybe they marry, they have children, they have blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Then their link in the Ndrangheta would be me, as in me in Calabria, in the Piromalli family. They would have zero interest, zero clue, zero necessity to interact with the broader Ndrangheta structure. It's a clan to clan situation, family to family, home to home. I come from here, my right. family is here, I interact with my family, unless there is a problem. If there is a problem, then we have to activate a number of different resources. And this is where things get complicated because yeah. whether if you are in Canada, if you have a problem, you have the Canadian people. Correct. If you are in Belgium and you are one standalone clan, then your mutual support would be back in Calabria overall. But yeah. the interesting thing of the Ndrangheta is that it could easily be an individual, one individual linked to the clan, and that's it. Interesting. And they wouldn't have anything to do. So that's how it, it preserves. It, can, it basically detaches the criminal organization with the criminal activity. The criminal, like the person who is andranguetista in Montpellier or in uh, Nantes or in Brussels, doesn't need to know the ndrangheta structure, all of it in Calabria. They wouldn't. They don't have access to it. They are absolutely not even privy to it. So this well, creates problems when uh, for law enforcement, by the way. Well, that's what that's what makes it strong is that kind of decentralization yeah. um, and structure. So my final question, and I asked Antonio yeah. Ricasso this, and I was a little surprised yeah. by the answer, but I want to hear your answer. Right. You, could right. have din- you could have dinner yeah. with, and I'm just going to say broadly, any mafioso, dead or alive, one dinner, you know, right. you're on vacation, he, he, well, most of the he shows up, and uh, um, you could have dinner mm-hmm. with any mafioso, dead or alive, who would it be and why? Wow, that's a that's an interesting question. Um, I think at this stage in history, I would say Matteo Messina Denaro. <laughs> that's because the guy has been oh my, I just want to know what the hell did he go? <laughs> so it, the whole world is looking for him. So he's really very, very astute, yeah. or really we are completely missing the point, and he's somewhere enjoying life and sun somewhere. Wow. So probably Matteo Messina Denaro, and also because I think that as a Ndrangheta scholar, um, I and as a Ndrangheta, sorry, as a as a Calabrian, let's say that I've met, uh, I've seen oh, some of the of bosses. They're not that great. <laughs> <laughs> so the Sicilian history is yeah. full of charismatic men. Yes, with a certain which create the kind of clash in your head where, oh my God, why are you such a charismatic man and you are a mafioso? Why aren't you something else? Correct, correct. correct. Calabria is not necessarily like that. You have yep. some men similar yep. to that, but they, they, the status of the Ndrangheta doesn't allow people to reach that kind of level of you know power. So I think I would probably choose a Sicilian. That's a, that's a great answer. And, and yeah. I, think you would, I think you would agree though, the Indragata likes it that way, meaning yeah, like, absolutely. I, 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 uh, I, um, I, I, okay. I just have one Indragata story. It's stupid. It's corny, but in, yeah. in the town that I mentioned to you, um, yeah. they insulted like the local boss, uh, it's the father of the bride insulted the local boss. It wasn't an insult uh, to death, but it just is an insult. So at the wedding of his son, um, mm-hmm. they had a wedding cake and they poisoned the wedding cake enough where everybody in the town got sick. Wow. <laughs> I don't know why I love that story. I think it's well, funny. Well, they are they are petty sometimes. <laughs> <down there>. Yeah. <laughs> that's probably oh, yeah. the, uh, why they're strong, you know? <laughs> indeed, indeed. And then also it goes to show the difference between honor and yeah. uh, reality. <laughs> wow. So. so listen, uh, gra- grazie per essere qui. Oggi per la e buona fede agosto. Grazie. Let me know when it comes out and I'll send it to my publisher who will be pleased. Absolutely. Right. And more, most importantly, 
Listen, hey. I didn't get a lot into the book. And the reason why I do that is I wanted to extract a lot of knowledge from Dr. Sanjay when she was here. Um, but also Chasing the Mafia. I mean, it, it's one of the best reads. If you don't know about the Italian kind of landscape, um, this gives you the roots to really understand. And, and that's what I wanted to kind of uncover today. Now that you learn a little bit about Indraga, this is a really important book. Drop Thank a you. link below and please get your copy. Thank you. Grazie. And ciao. Ciao. Have a good day. Ciao, ciao. ciao, ciao.